Okay, hello everybody. Um, there's been a big delay in what normally happens at the end of Michaelmas term, which is that the Michaelmas officers hand over to their successors, the Lent officers. So we'll be doing that tonight. Um, so, without further ado, we'll get this out of the way and then we can hand over to Lauren Davidson, who is your new president. So, Abid Mohammed served as Ents officer for Michaelmas term. He will be replaced in Lent by Rebecca Garras. Can you two please switch over? Abid, thank you for your work. Frankie Hill was a Michaelmas officer, uh, executive officer. She'll be replaced with Callum McDonald. <laughs> Callum, for some reason, is in trouble. I'm not sure. <laughs> speaker's officer, Julian Palmer was a Michaelmas term speaker's officer. He'll be replaced by Rebecca Bailey. Noah McDonald was the treasurer for Michaelmas term, and she will be replaced by Anna Harper. <laughs> and finally, your new president, Lauren Davidson. We got that one right. <laughs> um, good evening and welcome to Lent term at the Cambridge Union. The term card is out so I hope you've had a look. We've got um, Ian McKellen in a couple of weeks followed by just a few days later the top MPs in the country debating the coalition government. Um, so do have a look at that and we hope to see you all here. Tonight we've got this house believes the BBC is failing the country. On the proposition we've got James Council, outgoing president, Roger Olson, executive editor of The Times, and Tom Davenport, who is a student at Sydney Sussex College. <laughs> On the opposition, we've got Sophie Lloyd, who is a student and interned at the BBC last summer. We've got John Sopel, who is a BBC News reporter. And we've got Peter Bowserjet, who is the creative mind behind TV shows such as Big Brother and Deal No Deal, and a former union president, so thank you very much. James to open for the proposition. Um, I would like to say a few things before my time starts because I have a rare opportunity to actually speak to a lot of people about how much help I've received in running this place and how grateful I am for doing it. Um, obviously the Mikramas team were an immense help. This place would not function without the staff and there are a huge number of students who just devote the odd time here and there who do make this place possible. It just wouldn't happen without them. So please, all of you, give a round of applause to everyone who makes this place possible. Because the handover of officers usually happens at the end of the outgoing president's term, I stand here and I say lots of complimentary things about the incoming president, and I really, really hope that they actually follow through. Whereas I have the, the good fortune of standing here after the incoming president has done, well, her team as well, have done all their work, and every one of you can see quite how good the term is they've put on. I'd be very surprised if many of you here would dispute the fact that it is one of the best terms I've ever seen put on at the Cambridge Union, so all of you are very well done. And on that note, I will actually start arguing for the proposition. So, this house believes that the BBC is failing the country. My argument hinges upon two premises. Um, the first one, I hope, will not be too controversial because I've got very limited time. So hopefully we can accept that and move on to the second one, which is probably a lot more controversial. Um, before I begin, I want to make it clear that I am ideologically very sympathetic to what the BBC could be. Um, the media in any free society raises a serious tension. We don't want to throw the media to be completely dependent upon the state for obvious reasons, but the alternative often seems to be to throw out on the whims of the market. The BBC potentially resolves this conflict because we need the population to be educated, but in a free press the population often refuse to pay for the things they truly need to know to make democracy work. By claiming to be above the fray, above the need to pursue the ratings that other media channels are forced to pursue, while still being independent of the state, the BBC, in theory, makes the democracy possible by allowing free information that's necessary but also independent. 
obviously there's a caveat to that, which is that it's necessary for the BBC to be ideologically neutral, to not be a machine for propaganda, and that is where I start to raise serious problems. So the first premise, which hopefully you will just accept this and I can state it and we can move on, and if you have problems, please point to information, I'll try and defend it. My first premise is that if the BBC betrays a systemic bias in its reporting of information, then it loses all claims to legitimacy and is therefore failing the country. It is unacceptable to compel one portion of the population to finance an institution that broadcasts a competing worldview of a different section of the population. This would be a propaganda machine, pure and simple, and would have no place in a liberal democracy. Hopefully everyone can agree with that. So before I go on to the second point, which the BBC does, in fact, betray the bias. But contrary to the... <laughs> it's essentially become accepted wisdom that the BBC has an innate left liberal bias. So received this wisdom, the Director General himself has made kind of po-faced apologies for this fact. So I'm going to devote the rest of my speech to arguing the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> I believe... Um, the BBC essentially betrays an innate institutional bias in favour of the British establishment, so that it in effect acts as an incredibly reactionary force. That means any left-wing progressive movement faces this monolithic media block. Sorry, sir, yes? Is it theoretically possible for any new organisation to have no ideological bias? Uh, no, but it's very important that the BBC actually attempts to live up to this ideal, and that what I'm going to try and show you is that it fails so massively that it's clear that it's not even really trying. But I agree, obviously, the idea of neutrality is itself difficult, but we can be a lot closer than the BBC actually is. Um, so, the fact that the BBC um, betrays an innate establishment, anti-progressive bias. Um, for the sake of brevity and clarity, I'm going to divide my argument into domestic reporting and international reporting. My key point is, at home, the BBC frustrates change, and abroad, it acts as little more than a cheerleader for British foreign policy. Um, there are endless examples you can choose. Obviously, it's a 24-hour news rolling, uh, rolling news station. Um, so, for sake of argument, I'm going to sort of reduce it to two um, domestic policies and two international reporting, and it kind of gives you a flavour of what I'm talking about. So, firstly, um, the, stu the protest movement, but the way the BBC reports it. Anyone who attends a demonstration will suffer a strong sense of dislocation from reality as they later watch the BBC's coverage. Police suppression is now so brutal and so blatant that disabled groups representing those who are set to lose the most from the government's agenda are actively warning those who are vulnerable not to attend. Many of you will have seen a video of police officers dragging Jodie McIntyre, a man with cerebral palsy, from his wheelchair, but this is simply the most photographic, photogenic example of the mass violence perpetrated against all those who dare to enact their right to protest. Anybody in this audience who's been on a protest recently will have experienced massive police brutality, whether that's essentially arbitrary arrest without, uh, without a detention without arrest, without medical facilities that are desperately needed, without any toilet facilities, um, cavalry charges into the crowd, generally horrific scenes, thousands of people being brutalised on the streets. Um, the BBC's de coverage of the demonstrations amounts to little more than the repeating of the official police lines. The rare acts of violence by the idiotic minority are obsessively replayed. The minuscule number of police casualties dominate every report. Lies go completely unchallenged. For example, whenever you watch a live reporting of a demonstration, the, uh, the BBC will absolutely insist that what the kettle does is it allows people to be channeled out slowly. And that's just not remotely what happens. Um, last year, the police murdered a man at the G20 protest, and the BBC completely ignored this by, despite repeated attempts to make them recognise the fact, and were later humiliated into actually reporting it by the independent media. And I'm not suggesting this is a conspiracy. It would be much easier if it was a conspiracy. Instead, it's a deep-seated cultural and ideological bias towards the institutions of the state. Senior police officers look and sound like the journalists with whom they have such close connections. When it comes to a conflict between an amorphous mass of citizens and the police, the BBC instinctively presents the narrative being fed to them by one of the actors in the conflict. This is not neutrality, this is propaganda. It allows the police to act in a way the public would never allow were they exposed to the true reality of what was happening on our streets. This could not be further from a left-wing bias. Any movement of the left relies upon the mobilisation of individuals in order to highlight the shortcomings of the status quo. How is this possible when the current police strategy ensures that the vast majority are too cowed to dissent and the very few that do dissent are portrayed as violent anarchists? Okay, a second domestic area which hopefully illustrates the innate uh, establishment bias is the re reporting of the royal family. Jeremy Paxman complains that the BBC acts as essentially a courtier to the royal family, fawning over them, and I'm literally quoting him there. Um, an example he gives is following the death of the Queen Mother, when all the BBC reporters were required to wear black as if in mourning, and the BBC led the nation as mourning in chief. When the royal occasions occur, the BBC does not report the royal occasion, it leads the nation in celebration. The endless nauseating hours devoted to Will and Kate's wedding is an absolute insult to the tens of millions of people in this country who actually think that we should get rid of this feudal anachronism and we 
don't particularly want to pay, to be forced by criminal sanction to pay for the BBC to fawn over the House of Windsor. Um, tragically, these two points were unrelated when I last was going to make this speech last term, and is now very much related. On the 10th of December, Alfie Meadows was, had received brain surgery after being beaten over the head by a police baton. Um, he very nearly died. The BBC main coverage of the day was of the Duchess of Cornwall suffering the indignity of being poached with a stick. Um, <laughs> So as reactionary as the BBC's reporting is of domestic politics, it really does pale in comparison when you actually look at how it reports the international scene. When I say it has an establishment bias, I mean, you know, domestically, you kind of, that's quite a vague concept, but on the international scene, you know what the establishment is. It's British foreign policy. So I'll give you just two examples, because again, it's very little time. Um, given the seven-year tragedy that's unfolded in Iraq, um, I hope I can say largely without controversy that it was an absolutely massive mistake. Millions remained displaced, hundreds of thousands died. We were led to this war on a lie. We were basically led in this war because our government was determined to hitch itself to the insane foreign policy of the American neoconservatives. Um, when our governments announced they intended to go to war, um, massive discontent around the world. An estimated 36 million people across the globe took part in protests. Hans Blix, the Chief Weapons Inspector for the United Nations, reported that no evidence of prescribed activities had so far been found. And Kofi Annan, then Secretary General of the United Nations, said of the invasion, from our point of view, from the Charter point of view, it was illegal. So how did the BBC handle this incredibly contentious story? It's, I was genuinely shocked when I found this out. I hoped it would go my way with the argument, but I didn't quite realize how far it would go my way. According to the watchdog organization media tenor, in the build-up to the Iraq war, a mere 2% of the coverage allowed anti-war voices to be heard. This is worse than any other media organization in the world. It is dramatically worse than Fox News, where the fair and biased coverage is usually what we consider to be a paradigm of a reactionary bias, and yet the BBC was much, much worse. What's the inflation? Uh, yes, please, very... No. Sorry, no, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I've got one minute left. Um, so to move on very, very quickly then, to the reporting of Venezuela. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Venezuelan government is perfect, but what I am suggesting is like everything else in the world, it has two sides to the story. He's made huge progresses in you know, um, welfare for the poor and indigenous rights, literacy programs. Um, a report was conducted on the way the BBC reports in Venezuela and found that of the 304 stories in which Venezuela was mentioned between 1998 and 2008, only three of them mentioned Venezuela in anything other than negative terms. Virtually every single one that mentioned the election called into question his legitimacy, despite the fact that Hugo Chavez has faced his people more time than any British Prime Minister. One of them accused him of being equivalent to Hitler. Um, so, to move quickly into the conclusion, because I am completely out of time. Um, domestically, the BBC acts as a reactionary force. Um, because the journalists come from a certain background and the people they're reporting often come from the same background, you often find that the ministerial propaganda is essentially relayed through the BBC to the people. This is instinctively reactionary conservative bias, not a left-wing bias. Um, if I have managed to convince you of that with my examples, and if you do accept my first premise, that were the BBC to have an innate ideological bias, then it would be illegitimate, I sincerely hope that you will propose the motion. Thank you. Um, I call upon Sophie Lloyd to open the case of the opposition. I'm going to go back a bit more to the BBC's relationship with the British public. Whilst preparing for this debate, I discovered a website called www.mybbccomplaints.co.uk. This website has absolutely nothing to do with the BBC and any complaints made on this website do not ever reach the BBC in any kind of formal capacity whatsoever. So, why does it exist? On the homepage it states, have you ever found yourself shouting at the TV in annoyance? If you've been annoyed, upset or disgusted, then say it all here. I found myself asking why such individuals aren't going through the formal BBC complaints procedure, but luckily my question was answered a little further down the homepage. The point is, others can agree or disagree with you here. This, for me, summed up an important aspect of the British public's relationship with the BBC, which is that complaining is somewhat of a national hobby in Britain. Another such national hobby is watching the television, so the BBC really is hitting all the right spots for the British public. <laughs> the perfect stimulus for bitter complaint. My point really is this, we enjoy it. 
The BBC can never win, and we like that about it. It is quintessentially British to badmouth things that we actually really rather like. I, for one, and I feel I'm not alone, found the recent spoonerisms concerning Jeremy Hunt, the culture secretary, <laughs> highly amusing. <laughs> Such errors and subsequent complaints do not mean that the British public aren't fond of the BBC. And that's what this debate is about. Not the media's relationship with the BBC, nor pol particular political groups, but the British public, you or me. It is a complex relationship the me that the media fails to portray in a true and fair sense. The BBC is an eccentric and unique institution, one which in today's commercial media world seems to stick out like a th sore thumb. But it is valued, enjoyed and used by millions of people every day. The BBC is in an, an impossible position of pleasing an incredibly diverse population in terms of taste, expectations and political views, but we're all united by our disgruntledness. This seems to be acknowledged by the heading on the BBC complaints page, your complaint is important to us. We should take a realistic and moderate ground in considering the BBC this evening. We can acknowledge its shortcomings without saying it is failing the British public or the country. Furthermore, I do not think these shortcomings are significant to the British public view, as the media portrays. Whilst I interned at the BBC in the summer, my main role as the dog's body of the office was to go through the huge stack of letters sent into the office by members of the public. Yes, many complained, but many, many more were praising and most, well, quite a few were just creepy stalker letters to presenters. Um, it was interesting to note, out of the complaints received, how many contradicted one another. As a theologian, I was put in the religion and ethics department. I found that for any programme, there'd be one letter that stated, as an atheist, I found this programme far too Christian. And another complaining about the same programme, this programme needs to get back to its Christian roots and stop pandering to secular society. A programme is at any one time too religious and not religious enough. In the case of any docu a, do a particular documentary that the BBC produced, it was too biased towards Israelis and Zionists, and at the same time the most outrageously anti-Zionist piece of television ever seen. The BBC is expected to be neutral, but this proved that somehow many interpret neutrality as reflecting their own individual views. I have heard the BBC being accused of being disgraceful in its right-wing right propaganda and simultaneously an institution full of left-wing arty liberals. <coughs> The BBC is currently undergoing a period of great change faced with the challenges of the di digital switchover, relocation to the new Salford base in the north and huge cuts to the budget. Throughout these changes I think it is evident that the BBC never fails to react to public opinion and indeed put it first on their agenda. There was a huge reluctance by the BBC staff in the south to relocate to the north, a reluctance which as a Mancunian I have little time for. But this move is one to benefit the British public and eventually reduce costs. The BBC have reacted strongly to the public horror in discovering huge salaries in their star presenters and top managerial roles. Recently there has been a cull of top pre presenters at the BBC, including the Deputy Director General and Jonathan Ross and his £6 million a year contract is gone. The BBC is entering a new era where, as the BBC Trust Chairman put it, we are simply not going to see what the public regard as excessive salaries. Furthermore, the licence fee has been frozen for six years, which will result in a tighter budget for the BBC. In the new BBC strategy presented in 2010, Mark Thompson, the Director General, announced that by 2016, 90p in every licence fee £1 will be spent on content and distribution of the programmes. There's incredibly um, more focus on the five public-focused editorial priorities, which are supposed to be in place by 2013. The BBC aims to do fewer things better and make the licence fee work harder. This is not an organisation which is failing us, but constantly ev evolving to meet the expectations and needs of the British public. This is summed up by the conclusion of the strategy, which stated that the long-term goal is to deliver a strong, confident BBC focused on what the public really value. The somewhat eccentric method of funding the BBC, the licence fee, actually has a huge number of benefits. Alternative methods, such as subscription fees, would simply not produce the same quality of programmes or allow the same level of accessibility. Subscription methods work in America because they have a population that's big enough to support such a scheme. In Britain, in order to have the same support for high quality broadcasting, we need the licence fee to ensure the funding for quality across the spectrum. It is this funding model, with government support, which has allowed the BBC to invest far more per head of, per population in original production than in any comparable country. The BBC invests more than three times as much in original production per head than Italy and Spain, and more than twice as much in Germany and France. This is why the BBC is a, a service valued abroad and enjoying an excellent worldwide reputation. BBC 
BBC Worldwide has over a thousand episodes of BBC TV, TV programmes up on the US iTunes website, competing with the best of the US comedy and drama programmes. As for the programmes themselves, there is a clear and successful effort to ensure entertainment for every age group and every lifestyle in the UK, and the focus is on the programme itself, not its commercial viability. The BBC can boast of huge success stories, which, such as the relaunch of Doctor Who and hugely successful period dramas. However, the BBC also provides programmes which are less popular, but loved by particular viewers. For example, I worked quite a lot on Songs of Praise, one of the BBC's longest-running programmes, and it's not going to be essential viewing for most and certainly would not be uh, available with a commercial broadcasting corporation. However, Songs of Praise still maintains about 2.5 million viewers every Sunday evening, many of which are elderly or housebound. It is this type of programme which is valuable to the British public and which only the BBC is able to provide. The BBC spans across a number of mediums from its website, educational materials, radio, television, DVDs, books, concerts and worldwide exports. It is incredible, an incredible social tool that provides a huge amount of varied entertainment. It is easy to forget this when simply reading the latest newspaper headlines about mismanagement, mismanagement bias, sexism, scandal, licence fee wastage, etc. The British public flocked to the BBC in force at major events. For example, the day after the general election, 17 million viewers watched BBC One in the evening to see the events unfold. Is this a, fa a service that's really failing the country? If the BBC aims to provide programmes that viewers wish to watch and that are easily accessible, I cannot see how failure even comes into it. In fact, despite the media, criti in, despite the media criticism that continues to plague the BBC, public support has not dropped. Today, over 90% of British households already have digital television, and over 70% have broadband, yet there are still hundreds of BBC channels being supported by those who choose to pay the licence fee. Across the UK population in 2010, 71% of people said they're glad that the BBC exists. Among readers of the Daily Mail, it's 74%, the Telegraph 82%, and the Sunday Times 85%. Such newspapers, then, are actually failing to represent the views of their readers. Each day, the pub British public switches on or switches over to the BBC approximately 175 million times across TV, radio, and the web. What we say about the BBC and how we actually use it never seems to be reconcilable. In fact, I would not be su surprised if, after all the damning things that, the, that the, they have said this evening, my friends on the proposition go home and watch a bit of iPlayer before bed. <laughs> The next five years are going to be crucial for the development of the BBC. It is pointless branding the BBC a failure at the very beginning of this crucial period, and more so it ignores the majority support of the British public who want the BBC to succeed and improve on the valued service that is already provided. So vote against this notion and note the difference between shortcomings and failure. The BBC is, as the Di Director General puts it, a public space founded on the belief that there is room for a place which is neither part of the government or the state, nor pur purely governed by commercial transactions actions, which everyone is free to enter and within which they can encounter culture, education, debate, where they can share and swap experiences. Voting for the opposition acknowledges that the BBC serves the British public and provides quality broadcasting. So if you, like me, have enjoyed recent classics such as Sun, Sex and Suspicious Parents, Aya Napa, walk through the Nador. Thank you. And to continue for the proposition, Roger Alton. That was a terrific show, actually, that. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, 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 slightly too high minded, but. Um, <laughs> And I'm afraid my view of the BBC, my opposition to the BBC is slightly more uh, lowbrow than your admirable, admirable uh, outgoing president, who, whose um, uh, views are very, very, very impressive. I mean, I'm also on a hiding to nothing here, I know that, because as your current uh, uh, president observed to me over dinner, uh, you've got a real problem here because happens nobody in this room at all pays their own TV licence because everybody's living at home. So uh, you're going to have to bear with me. Um, and uh, assuming there's a real problem, you probably, some of you have probably seen the recent uh, movie The King's Speech, which is jolly good. And it's about, of course, the glory of the BBC commuting to a grateful and anxious world and saving it. Um, less, in my view, of that 
nowadays, though. So if you want to see a perfect sort of encapsulation of how the BBC is failing the nation, take a trip down the A23, lovely road, into London, and there in the classier reaches of outer Thornton Heath, you'll see something that hits you like a big bomb. It's a giant poster of Don and Betty from the brilliant TV series Mad Men. And it's advertising series five of this masterpiece of TV. Uh, it's not like sun, it's not as good as uh, obviously Sunsex and Napa, but there we are. And uh, but series five of Mad Men is on Sky. When it was on the BBC, there was no advertising. It was marooned late at night on BBC, BBC Four and watched by um, a handful of admittedly quite grateful people. So typically, the BBC didn't know what a gem it had on its hands and they didn't tell anybody about it. So it's only when these things are with a commercial broadcaster are you told about it. You let know the, the people say things because it matters how many people see something. Another tiny little uh, point. If you haven't been living too far out of Cambridge recently, you may have noticed an East Enders storyline about a cot death and theft of a baby. Fiction, as it happens. There's obviously a wave of protests for bizarre reasons, uh, largely led by a terrifying bunch called Mumsnet, which uh, is taking on the flu and ever-changing qualities of Al-Qaeda. Mumsnet... <laughs> Uh, Mumsnet wrote to Mark Thompson, the lavishly paid and heavily bearded uh, Director General of the BBC, uh, complaining. And guess what? Um, the BBC, rather than just saying, shove it, uh, caved in and agreed to end the plot line. So there's the BBC, in two little examples, uh, ignorant about how good some of its shows are, not that they make them, and absolutely supine in the face of hostility. Now I want to take you back to the 1980s when the BBC had a strike of its newsroom staff. Listeners to the morning slot on Radio 4 tuned in and they heard this announcement. Owing to industrial action at the BBC, today has been cancelled. And uh, that's the perfect encapsulation of the BBC view of the world. Whatever the weather forecast, the sun rises over Broadcasting House and it sets over TV centre. The BBC's got some great journalists. John is here tonight. It's fantastic. It broadcasts some great programmes. It has a great news gathering operation. But it's not necessary for anyone uh, uh, to say how pleased they are with our BBC, like our opponents uh, are here, because the BBC is pleased enough with itself. We could talk about the preposterous pay levels, the hundreds of managers paid more than 100 grand, Mark Thompson with more than 800k, Alan Yentob with well over 300,000, countless pension extras, most of which seems to go on maintaining his terrific tan. We could talk about the 25,000 odd staff, the 56 uh, weather forecasters, the assorted insane jobs such as head of brand guardianship, head of measurement, Christ knows what that is, and uh, de <laughs> deployment project manager, brackets, content management culture, close brackets. Uh, no, our, our argument is more substantial. The BBC is incredibly important, but it is also complacent, timorous, bureaucratic, expensive, they're not, obviously, to some of you guys here. And as a body, often lazy, not John. And this matters, <laughs> all this matters because the corporation is so dominant. It matters because its dominance is paid for by, I was going to say by you, but I was obviously mistaken, by the rest of us, by Peter and myself. Um, uh, and the, the dominance matters because of all the things that don't happen, that don't get shown and won't be done because of the BBC's huge power. This is how the BBC fails a nation. The BBC has 78% of the television news audience. It towers over its competitors on radio. Its internet site is read all over the world. It believes, I think, that it owes this supreme position to its own excellence. And that reminds me of the man who goes into a bookstore and says, I'd like, uh, I'd like a book on chutzpah and you're paying. It owes its position to the fact that regulation allows it, thank you, Peter, and the taxpayer funds it. That's a slow burner, but, you know, it's only, it's only Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> And it owes its position to the fact that regulation allows it and the taxpayer funds it, and this has cost. First cost, number one, first cost, is because the BBC dominates, one view of the world dominates, and I slightly disagree with uh, James, though he's obviously considerably brighter than I am. The BBC probably feels it tries hard to be neutral and to represent everyone's view, to get the balance right, and try it does, but it can't succeed. And it can't succeed because it doesn't know what balance is, what neutrality is, what fairness is, and it interprets it 
to interpret all these things through its worldview, and it's a worldview formed by its primarily metropolitan, overwhelmingly young, and usually liberal staff. It thinks that people bang on about immigration rather than are concerned about it. It thinks that Eurosceptics are Euro nutters. It's sure that Tony Blair lied about Iraq. It thinks that unions are unreasonable, unless they're professional unions, in which case their authority is unquestionable. Um, <laughs> Some of these views are mine, and that I live in London, of course, I am overwhelmingly young. And <laughs> in this way, because of its dominance, you laugh rather loudly, that's right, and its failure to appreciate its dominance, the BBC does fail the nation. They're the second cost. Because it's so powerful, it doesn't try hard enough. Uh, in its position of immense privilege, it's nowhere near as good as it should be. So a small portion of most people's income is taken by law to ensure that the BBC is not only the largest, but the most secure funding stream of any broadcast organisation in the whole bloody world. Any other company, any other business, free from the need to raise money through advertising or subs, it would be radical and daring, leading the industry into new formats and new broadcasting ecology, breaking new talent. So with absolute funding certainty, what's the BBC's best programme? Celebrity Dancing with Bruce Forsyth. Strictly, come off it. When the BBC just lamely copies... Pro it's quite a good joke, but it didn't really... Where, <laughs> When the BBC just lamely copies programmes that are already available in the marketplace, it's taking our money and wasting it. Recently, in preparation for this debate, I conducted an experiment. A sort of experiment somebody has to do, difficult though it is. And I imagine that as dedicated students determined to get the best for your expensive education, you may have done this experiment yourself. And I spent the morning watching the BBC's daytime programming. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Bargain hunt. You'd like to hear what Jim Nocty made of that one. Uh, <laughs> then a show about what Mark Thompson does with his absurd salary? Cash in the attic. <laughs> Car booty? Homes under the hammer? To buy or not to buy? That expensive English degree wasn't wasted, was it? It's not difficult, is it, now, is it? I've watched 47 cookery shows in the last three days. And I can give you the BBC recipe. Take four and a half billion quid of taxpayers' money, award yourself a substantial chunk of it, give most of the rest to Graham Norton, then turn over to ITV, turn over to ITV, have a, have a quick look at what they've got on and copy it. Uh, <laughs> hey presto, BBC One and BBC Two. Um, so it's not really the poll tax I particularly mind, it's not really that. It's just that surely with this massive budget and the certainty of revenue for 10 years at a time, can't they do better? Where's the new writing? Where are the new plays? Where's the new comedy? Where? Better, better on well, anyway. Let me just give you some better bad men. You know, fantastic all from America. Let me give you a third way the BBC fails the nation. And it seeks to stifle competition. Unbelievably, and without any sense of irony, the BBC's led the charge against my own employer. Temporarily, I fear. Uh, news Corporation's bid to purchase the shares in Sky that it doesn't already own. The BBC, with all its muscle and all its power, is claiming this threatens media plurality. I could list you about 350 things that the BBC runs from BBC Suffolk to BBC whatever, you know, it just goes on forever. Honestly, I promise you, one minute, Jesus. Honestly, I promise you, you couldn't, you, honestly, you couldn't make this up unless you're working for a BBC phone, in which case you could make it up. Uh, um, so, and anyway, what I'm trying to say is we move to a more me integrated media environment, the BBC market position becomes increasingly important. The corporation was established as a taxpayer-funded body because the technology required, required it. It doesn't anymore. It used to be impossible for people to pay for a program they wanted to watch. Now it's perfectly possible. The BBC competes against other broadcasters, against other internet providers, against other radio stations, newspapers, on a totally unfair basis. Um, uh, the BBC's not content with just funding some public program. It wants to sweep all before, and it will if we let it. Anyway, just to... I don't, please don't hassle. Please don't kill me. Uh, Britain can have a fantastic future as the modern media hub of the world, but not if we allow monopoly power to suffocate us. If this motion fails today, if it fails today, think of the message you're sending. The Cambridge Union says it doesn't think the BBC can do better. The Cambridge Union says it's satisfied with the political balance of the media. The Cambridge Union says it doesn't mind monopoly power. The Cambridge Union thinks we can seize the future without doing anything different. The opponents of this motion preach complacency. complacency. They say, don't do something, just stand there. We say, send a message, demand change, 
pass the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, thank you very much. I'm delighted as the presenter of the Politics Show to be here on such a quiet day in politics at <laughs> Westminster. Uh, BBC, I think it's got about 17,000 employees now. Anyway, there are two bits to the BBC, however which you d divide it. There's the B and there's the C. You either work for the B or you work for the C. And I've spent my career working uh, as a broadcaster and not for the corporation. So I'm not going to stand before you this evening and defend every bit of excess that there may have taken place over uh, executive salaries. Were some of them paid too much? Probably, possibly, yeah. Are we at times bureaucratic? Almost certainly. Cumbersome, slow, maybe that as well. So I'm not coming here tonight to defend every piece of bad decision making that may have been taken place over the past years and that you would find in any organisation. What I seek to argue though is have we let down the nation? No. I want to talk a little bit about being part of the B rather than the C, but being a broadcaster uh, in the BBC and talking about what I think is a magnificent independence that there is about us. And I'm going to start with some, maybe some recent journalistic events which the Times took a very close interest in. And that was when Daily Telegraph reporters went and conducted a covert recording uh, with Mr Vince Cable, the business secretary. Two young women uh, went uh, pretending to be constituents. He found himself giggling and saying he wanted to go to war uh, with Rupert Murdoch. Now, as Roger has pointed out, the BBC does, has no vested interest in uh, B Sky B and News International taking out or buying back all the shares in B Sky B. In fact, Mark Thompson, the Director General, controversially uh, signed a letter against it. But it was the BBC that broke the story that the Telegraph had not reported what it had got in that interview. Because in the initial interview, that, uh, in the initial reporting in the Daily Telegraph, they made no mention of Vince Cable wanting to go to war with News International. And there are some who suspect the reason they didn't was that the Telegraph have got a vested interest in keeping Vince Cable as business secretary, and they thought, if we expose this, Vince Cable is toast. And so it was the BBC who reported it, even though we had no interest in doing so. And what did your paper say the next day? I'll quote you. Um, the story came to light only because the BBC exposed it, and it is greatly to the credit of that organisation, which also has an obvious interest in the questions of media plurality and ownership that it chose to do so. Now, Roger, you were talking about going down the A23 into London. Like much of what you said, you've got it a bit upside down. I think you go up the A23 into London from Brighton. And so I don't know what you were doing going down the A23 into, Bright into London, so leave that to one side. <laughs> Let me toss in another example where I think BBC journalism has been inconvenient uh, for our masters and for the establishment. And that is over England's bid to host the World Cup. Immense pressure on the organisation to pull that programme until after FIFA had met. Because the worry was that the BBC, by broadcasting it, would damage England's chances. Well, we saw the process. And how many people afterwards watching Russia and Qatar get the World Cup thought that the BBC was wrong to expose what may have been the wrongdoing within uh, FIFA? Now, James, you made a number of very interesting points about the way the BBC goes about things. Um, and so let's just take them one by one, and I hope this doesn't seem unfair. Uh, Jodie McIntyre, the disabled student. What interest was it in the police for us to show that footage again and again and again? Do you think the police got good PR out of being seen to drag a disabled student out of a wheelchair? Do you think that was a winning day for the... By all means. Like I've got so many more questions. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you save them? I'll tell you what, so save them for a minute because I've got another one. Um, 
Uh, police murdered a man at the G20. Not even a little alleged in there. You're deciding that he was murdered? Shouldn't we, the BBC, let the judicial process take its course and then decide whether someone was murdered? That's the second one. I've got a third. I've got a third. No, no, they're easy to remember. I'll remind you of them in a moment. Tens of millions... I've got good shorthand, you see. We, do, we learn shorthand when we're being journalists. Tens of millions who want to get rid of the royal family. I just want to know where that statistic comes from and who would independently verify that. Because successive opinion polls do seem to show enormous support for uh, the royal family. Anyway, those are the, the three that I've just... Quickly, you want to...? OK, right. <laughs> oh, and I was on the Iraq border. At the, in 2003, at the invasion of Iraq, so and sure all the initial reports were all the initial reports were yeah. about the friendly fire incidents, which were calamitous uh, for the Allied forces that were moving in. You have four there. Yeah. Okay. I took your four. Yeah. Julian McIntyre was shown over and over again on other broadcasters. Um, ben Brown desperately tried to justify the police actions after sharing that video by insinuating that a man who had previously explained he could not use his own wheelchair was rolling towards the police and therefore required dragging from his wheelchair and beating. Um, Ian Tomlinson, okay, murder may be a strong term, I'll accept that point. As to whether or not it should have, um, the BBC had a vested interest in showing it, the BBC refused to pursue the allegations until the BBC uncovered a video which was known to exist, which the BBC refused to go after, um, which showed conclusively the police Okay, contact. you're really eating into my time. So, what's the third one? I, third one. I think we've heard uh, enough. That's, that was good. Uh, it was good, okay. moderate defence there so far. <laughs> this is what we get given when we go to work for the BBC the editorial guidelines. This is 400 pages. To, no, 369, I exaggerate. To keep, us, <laughs> to keep us honest and to keep us straight. This time last week I was preparing to present the BBC's coverage of uh, the by-election that was taking place in Oldham and Satterworth. No other broadcaster took that live. Public service. We were doing it for public service. Who were the four bro first broadcasters to get into Tunisia when all of the, 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 the Jasmine revolution was unfolding? It was the BBC. We send people where the stories are that may not have huge commercial uh, interest, but that is what we do. We can talk about other genres, the dramas, the sitcoms, the shows, the documentaries, the wildlife programmes and all the rest of it. We can talk about other programmes too. In a moment we're going to hear from uh, Peter Bazalgette and of course the inspiration uh, behind uh, Big Brother. Now that is the sort of reality TV show that we don't do at the BBC and I suspect were we to do so, then we might get charged with letting the country down. <laughs> In fact, I don't know whether you know this, but Peter Bazalgette, not only president of the union here, but his great-great-grandfather was the brilliant Victorian engineer, Sir William Bazalgette, who built London sewers. What's the matter with those? <laughs> Nothing, but there are those who would argue today that reality television is filling those sewers. Ah, an original joke. Anyway, and what else doesn't the BBC do? We don't have Mad Men, as you say. Great series. Very sorry. But would people think that was a good use of our money? We don't have live premiership football. I wish we did. I wish I didn't have to have spent the past few nights, a few weeks ago, staying up all night watching The Ashes on Sky. But people would say that was a misuse of uh, licence payers' money. I have Sky at home. I think it's a fantastic product. I think it's innovative and new. A lot of what the BBC is also doing is innovative and new. But my Sky subscription costs me four times, four times the price of the licence fee. The licence fee is £142.50. Just think of the educational value that we give in that £142.50 compared to the £9,000 you're now going to have to pay in your newly trebled uh, tuition fees. Uh, so, letting down the nation, BBC's 1, 2, 3, 4, the news channel, the parliament channels, radios 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, regional telly, the local radio network, national regions online, the iPlayer, etc, etc. They all give spectacular value for money. And I could carry on giving you more and more, you know, a stat bomb. Not as much fun as a Jaeger bomb, but anyway, probably without as much damage to your health. 85% of the UK watches BBC television every week, more than any other broadcaster. 97% of the UK consume BBC content each week. So let me conclude by saying this. 
The plain truth is that the BBC delivers public value that more than justifies its licence fee. It is a model public institution which, is in, which enriches the country and our lives. The licence fee is cheap at the price. Not my words. Roger Alton's when he was editor of The Observer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. we open up to the floor. Um, we'll go through rounds of proposition, opposition and abstention. Please keep your speeches to one minute and when you stand up, name your sta name, state your name and college. Um, do we have a point in proposition of the motion? Christopher Mount Trinity Hall. Um, I was um, gratified um, that the previous speaker named some of the very, very, very many um, <coughs> services the BBC provides. It is my view, and one that is shared, I believe, by a, a substantial proportion of um, people, of business and um, financial experts, that the problem with the BBC, principally, is that it provides so many services that could be provided by commercial um, outlets, and the BBC doesn't add anything by spending our money that we have to give it on it. I mean, Okay, Radio One provides a great, a great service, and I don't denigrate the music of Playboy, but surely that could be provided by commercial radio and shouldn't be taken by force from our pockets the money to run it. Do we have a floor point in opposition? Yeah, up there. Yeah. Yeah, Harry and um, Keith Bullock. I just want to take issue with one of the things that the second speaker for the proposition said, because in a way it illustrates this silly little mentality of people who just really want to have a vote about things. He doesn't really completely construct and say, he doesn't like cash yet, well, it's not really targeted at him. He doesn't expect that you might watch a new tonight, the Today programme, and also for all of which are some of the best new programmes on British television. And it's silly to point out the background. City. Because while well, I'll point out that Sky advertised it a lot more, he negated, he misses the point that the BBC was the one who took a chance on it when nobody had heard of it in this country. It, and it probably is a could be playing country in many ways. Surely the British media, which is dominated by Murdoch and can organise things against um, mid scale to get him out of the way so he can get his business done more efficiently. <laughs> and the Daily Express was chopped in dinosaurs on Monday because nothing's ever interesting happens on Sunday. So surely it's not just the BBC perspective, it's British media that's going to hold. So, so what, are we up with the BBC or are we arguing about general failures of the media? Oh, yeah, uh, James Scott, Jesus College. Uh, we have a situation in this country where the news industry is failing, where newspapers are hemorrhaging money, they're not a viable industry anymore. Uh, we have real market failure uh, in, in that respect. Now, using that sort of situation, the state could come in to correct the market failure. But in this case, the state is contributing to the market failure. Because what we've got is a huge, subsidised public body that is providing a mass rolling news channel that's providing a very vast, sophisticated website which is providing the competition uh, to, to these newspapers. So people don't have to pay for that product, they just get it free. And this, this, this means that the newspaper industry is no longer viable. And we don't have a viable newspaper industry, we don't have a viable democracy, we don't have a plurality of views and opinions that sort of centers the public discourse. And that's why the BBC is spending this country, because it's undermining the newspaper industry, which is one of the pillars of our democracy. Thank you. Opposition. 
position. Um, and I think this is a saving grace, that we don't speed ahead and make radical changes adapting to the whims and sort of passions of the general public because we have these moral hang-ups about preserving things like having the right to watch songs of praise on a Sunday afternoon. Um, the second point is that people seem to be making um, uh, a big thing about BBC's unwillingness to innovate. And this is coming from the point of being a relatively geeky kid, but anyone who's kind of seen any of these incredible wildlife programs and thinks that the BBC's got so much effort into funding the David Attenborough shares, the um, genius of Britain shows, can't argue that the BBC isn't championing innovation, creativity, and creating a sort of dynamic knowledge economy. My third point is a little bit of irritation of students being stereotyped as watching daytime TV and knowing more about uh, bargain hunt and cash in the attic than their actual degrees. I think if we spend so much time watching cash in the attic and actually found some, we wouldn't still be complaining about tuition fees. Thank you very much. <laughs> Luke Miranda, surprise to comment. Um, I, I'm in sort of two minds about this motion because I agree with what James Council said about uh, bias against Ben Slover, the pro establishment bias, and all of that. And I think that programs such as Flog It and Cash in the Attic constantly being repeated are a bit nauseating. But that's all made up for when you get a radio program like uh, Neil McGregor's History of the World of 100 Objects, uh, which was just incredible. And I can't imagine any other broadcast in the world putting on something of that uh, greatness, basically. Um, so I think the truth probably lies in somewhere in the middle. Opposition. Joseph Stiles from Jesus College. Uh, the question I would like to pose to the opposition today, and I don't think they've uh, given a good answer to it, is this. Um, if I went up to you um, and threatened you and took £142 from you, uh, even if I gave it to Oxfam, I would end up in prison. Why should BBC be allowed to take £142 from you uh, every life to be there? Um, and uh, without that license be pair necessarily watching. You said only 85% of people watch. That's 15% of people who are having their money taken who aren't getting hit before it. Point of opposition. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen. I have a slightly different point of view from most people in this chamber because I've spent a significant number of years living in countries that don't have the BBC. And I miss it. If you think the BBC is doing a bad job, try listening to some of the other countries' national broadcasters and see what kind of rubbish you get. I oppose this motion. The BBC may not be perfect, but it certainly isn't doing a bad job. Good evening. What I'm about to say will make more sense to this side of the room than to this side of the room. I'm going to make an admission. When I arrived here this evening, I was filled with a sense of utter horror. I thought, oh my God, the opposition are completely united. And how did I know this, you may ask? They've colour-coordinated their socks. 
They are exactly the same stripes. Astonishing. There must be a sort of must be a sort of <laughs> media guru look they're affecting there. I'll be, I'll be, point of information. Point of information. <laughs> um, Out of time. I think you're out of time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think, I think you're out of time. I think you're out of time. Is it kinky to sit there exposing them like that? <laughs> um, right. I'm. So, in, in, in this speech, I plan to uh, draw together what's been said by my two noble partners and show, uh, not in the kinky way, uh, and show why it is that the BBC is indeed failing the country. Um, it's a great honour to speak alongside uh, Roger Alton, and it's also a great honour to speak alongside my very good friend James Council. Um, as some of you may know, I agree with James Council about almost nothing. <laughs> Uh, our political, our ideological, even actually our aesthetic views uh, are pretty much polar opposite. Um, but it's astonishing that there are just two things in the whole wide world that James and I do agree on. Uh, the first, and we're both very clear about this, is that the president of the Cambridge Union Society is necessarily great. Um, just look at the chair. The Second point, and rather conveniently for the purposes of this evening, uh, is that the BBC is failing the country. Um, so I was very glad to speak in, in, in support of this motion. Um, I'm going to put it to you this evening, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully drawing together strands from the first two arguments, that the BBC is the UK's most brilliant, the UK's most respectable Failure. I, for one, love the BBC. I admire the BBC. It makes some bad programmes, and we've gone through them. It also makes some great ones, which have also been mentioned. Um, but as you can probably gather, I'm not going to try and convince you that the BBC was a bad idea in the first place. I'm not going to try and suggest that it should be dismantled now. But what I will show, I hope, is that necessarily the BBC has always failed. It's failing now, and it will forever fail the country. It's unavoidable and necessary, and it's no bad thing. It just simply is the case. <laughs> I recognise I haven't supported this yet, and that will happen. Um, so it's not the failure of the government, it's not the failure of any individuals, it's not the failure of anyone at the BBC, it just simply will happen. And the reason is that it fails to meet the standards it sets for itself and the standards which are expected of it by the country. M Luke made a very good point. He said, on, on, on the floor debate, um, I'm not quite sure where we are. I mean, we're sort of, sort of halfway in between. Well, in my book, we can't be halfway in between. We're either succeeding or we're failing. And in this instance, we're failing. So what are the aims that the BBC fails to meet? What are the, what are the benchmarks we're going to use in this debate uh, against which to measure the success of this illustrious organisation? Well, here they are, the official core values of the BBC. The BBC claims to be independent, impartial and honest. Well, we've debated this at length, and James has shown already that that simply cannot ever be the case. No reporting can actually be truly impartial. That was a good point made over there, I think. Um, the BBC then says that audiences are at the heart of everything we do. What on earth does that mean? It's also very problematic, and I'll address that later on. The BBC says they take pride in delivering equality and value for money. They claim that creativity is the lifeblood of their organisation. And most striking of all is the official vision of the BBC. The vision of the BBC, ladies and gentlemen, is to be the most creative organisation in the whole wide world. <laughs> the most creative organisation in the whole world. On top of this, consider our expectations. The, expect the expectations of the licence fee payer. What do we want? Well, what we want, what we expect, is the BBC should be impartial, enriching the best broadcasting organisation in the world, the most reliable, 
and the most trustworthy. We're holding it to account. That's great. We want the BBC to have great viewing figures, but at the same time we want them to produce programmes that are countercultural and enriching. We want the BBC to be iconic, infallible, a perfect reflection and projection of our own sense of ourselves, not that we necessarily think we're infallible. These are big asks, ladies and gentlemen. These are big asks, and they simply will not be met. They're not corporate targets. They're not year-on-year -year obtainable goals. They are ideological, philosophical, platonic even, superlatives. Like purity, goodness, or perfection. Of course the BBC fails to meet them. And that's fine, ladies and gentlemen, that's absolutely fine, because these ideals are still worth striving for. At my heart, at, at my heart, not at my heart, at this argument's heart, um, <laughs> the case is really quite simple. And I suppose to a certain degree it's quite Christian. We're all imperfect. That is to say, we fail to satisfy the notions of perfect goodness selflessness and so on. But that does not mean we go home and give up. We fail, but it's a very respectable failure. So I do not object to these ideals, and nor do I object to the BBC striving for them. All I'm saying is that the BBC will, necessarily, so long as it exists, fail to satisfy these goals. And now I come to a slightly different argument, that is of the unresolvable conflict that exists at the heart of the role of the BBC. Sophie's already highlighted this when she said herself uh, that the BBC comes up, a number, comes up against a number of problems. Well, yes, these problems are much more than just problems. They cause the BBC to fail, necessarily. On the one hand, you see, the BBC must legitimise the licence fee. Philosophical justifications aside, good viewing figures are how you do this. But then bowing down to the demands of the market means the BBC becomes no different from any other news organisations and, more importantly, fails in its duty to enrich the nation. So, on, on the other hand, if the BBC takes no notice of viewing figures, it loses all mandate to broadcast as a publicly funded organisation. So, the, the conundrum is, by its very nature, insurmountable. In reality, of course, in striving to satisfy both conflicting demands, the BBC fails both. And that's fine, ladies and gentlemen. As I've said, that's absolutely fine. It's not a problem, but it will do so. It does not democratically justify the licence fee, with stunning viewing figures, and nor does it reject populist programmes in favour of its own culturally and intellectually enriching agenda. Most of you will remember the Sapgate controversy, for me at least one of the highlights of 08. The hype produced by the scandal was the inevitable conclusion of an organisation operating like the BBC within a truly aggressively free press. Independent organisations will attack the BBC out of pure commercial interest. And this is why I take issue with John's point um, regarding, uh, regarding the BBC's uh, apparent, apparent no interest in, in the uh, Murdoch issue, uh, which is, I, I would suggest, utter, utterly ridiculous, because, of course, the more power Murdoch has, the greater potential there is for BBC to lose its market share, and therefore it certainly does have a vested interest, not economic, but in terms of its influence over the nation, yes, it does. Um, the hype produced by the Sackgate scandal uh, was inevitable, and, of course, in order to avoid exposing itself to more criticism, the BBC responded by imposing measures which reduced risk. These, of course, stifled creativity. Not the most creative organisation in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Um, many of you may have seen the Paxman and uh, Russell Brand interview last year. Uh, they discussed creativity at BBC in the wake of Sackgate, and Paxman handed Brand a form uh, which had to be filled in before any programme was deemed acceptable to be called broadcast, rather like that stifling book uh, that John so bizarrely showed us. <laughs> um, and Brand's work, Brand, Russell Brand's words in response to, to seeing this form were as follows. I don't know how this could be helpful for creativity, I can't do the voice obviously, uh, unless you use the back of it to make jokes on. <laughs> okay. The most creative organisation in the world, absolutely ridiculous notion. Stephen Fry himself uh, said of executives uh, that as soon as something new and different gets brought up, they immediately get cold feet, they fall back on something else, and we end up with something incredibly bland. Yeah, I'm going I'm to go sort of as fast as I can, um, but there are some incredibly sort of pertinent points coming up, so I can't, <laughs> I can't miss them out. Um, 
afraid. <laughs> um, so that, that, that was, we end up with something incredibly grand. I mean, that's, that's, this is the words of Stephen Fry, ladies and gentlemen. Stephen Fry, national treasure, Stephen Fry. Ex-Cambridge, national treasure, Stephen Fry. But I happen to think his words were a real exaggeration, but they make a good point. They make a good point, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I will do, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, right, so I will, I will actually, yes, I will wrap up with historical analogy. I'm going to use an analogy that I've learned in my intensive and aggressive academic studies, studying the uh, most rigorous subject that Cambridge University has to offer, history of art. Um, the Royal Academy of Arts is one of the great institutions of our country. It's widely respected, even loved, and rightly so. But like the BBC, the Royal Academy of Arts failed. The Royal Academy was founded in the 18th century by figures such as Sir Joshua Reynolds, knowledge, with the hope of stimulating a glorious era in British art. It failed because creativity does not come naturally from within institutions, even the most open-minded. Yes, the BBC is quite open-minded. History has shown us this time and time again. The BBC will fail. Ladies and gentlemen, the BBC is failing the country. That's obviously been said. Um, just as we ourselves fail to satisfy the ideals of goodness, purity, selflessness, the BBC falls short of its commendable ambitions to be impartial and superlatively creative. The BBC is a martyr of capitalism slain on the altar of corporate self-interest. <laughs> Not as good as I thought it would be, actually. Thought, yeah. um, but we knew this already. Reach for the stars and you will fall short, but it's still worth reaching for. So it's no shameful failure. In fact, the BBC is Britain's greatest and proudest ongoing failure. It's a glorious failure and one that I, for one, am more than happy to subsidise. But it is a failure nonetheless, so ladies and gentlemen, because you and I are fallible and because we admire the BBC for striving for the unobtainable, I urge you to vote in proposition of the motion. Madam President, thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. I was reflecting at breakfast this morning that it's a full 35 years, I know this is difficult to believe, since I was President of the Union. A man with a full head of hair, you're saying to yourself, as he has, how could it be? I said to my wife, it's 35 years since I was President of the Union. She looked at me and she said, I know dear, and now it's time to move on. <laughs> Madam President, I would like to congratulate you on, your, on being elected to that illustrious post. Uh, apparently, you were elected in a fair, free and ballot, a secret ballot. You're, you're disagreeing. It was corrupt. Wasn't it? <laughs> because in my day, it was a flattery, bribery, and the grant of sexual favours that got one. To <laughs> so if you were truly, freely elected, then I think it was utterly laudable, if a trifle old-fashioned. <laughs> Let me summarise, if I may, the arguments in favour of the BBC on this side of the House. This side of the House has argued this evening that we need the BBC today more than we've ever needed it in the past. The BBC, first and foremost, is a trusted and reliable source of information, source of news and information. I would argue to you, in the mad, chaotic Tower of Babel world of the internet, something that's only come upon us in the last decade, the world in which they think Elvis is still alive, they think Paul McCartney's dead, they think the Jews blew up the Twin Towers and they think homeopathic medicine works. And by the way, they think all of that, all of them. In that sort of mad world, you need a trusted and reliable source of information more than you needed it before the world of the internet. Secondly, the BBC is venture capital for the digital economy. The BBC uh, kick-started the digital economy with things like BBC Online, Freeview, iPlayer, UView to come later this year. Thirdly, the BBC is a massive investor in creative talent. And here I am not referring to Anne Widdicombe on the dance floor. <laughs> and fourthly, and it's a very important point, the BBC 
makes a massive investment in original content. Original content made in Britain for Brits to watch. That is something that enriches our culture, and they spend far more money on programming than other people do. It does all of those things, and it's hugely valuable as a result. That is why the BBC is not letting you down, not failing you, even if it makes mistakes. Now, let us come on to the first speech for the proposition, the enchantingly floppy-haired James Council. <laughs> He began his speech with a very clever ruse. I quote his words, I'm ideologically sympathetic to the BBC. James, welcome to this side of the house. <laughs> he talked about systemic bias at the BBC. He didn't have much evidence for it. He certainly had no statistical evidence. It was entirely anecdotal. But then it became clear, uh, yeah, please, my dear fellow, the floor is yours. Please tell us. <laughs> Entertain us. Make us laugh. Make us cry. <laughs> Their actual coverage allowed. Ah, uh, oh, 2%! I'm coming to 2%! Sit down, I'm coming to 2%. I'm coming to 2%. Because people like you who quote ludicrous statistics like that, do you know what I think about your speech? It was 2% reliable. That's what I think about your speech. I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm not interested in ludicrous statistics plucked out of the air like that. Um, uh, you know, you talked about systemic bias. But uh, it was clear you don't like the police very much, fair enough, point of view, point of view. Doesn't like the royal family very much, fair enough, point of view, point of view. Systemic bias, though, eh? <laughs> systemic. I reckon his speech was riddled with systemic bias, which is something on this side of the house we don't like at all, do we? We don't like it. <laughs> By the way, you mentioned Venezuela. That was a mistake. <laughs> do I need to say any more? No, perhaps I do. But the BBC actually uh, produced one of the greatest documentaries ever made in the Storyville series about Hugo Chavez coming to power. And perhaps foolishly, it was actually quite pro-Chavez, and you should have watched that programme before you made that remark. Um, otherwise, a very fine speech. Oh, somebody else is waving at me. Go on, yes. I've got much to say. It was pro-Chavez. Yes, yes, you don't have much to say, do you, Tom? No, sit down again. Right, uh, let's go on, shall we? And if I'm going to be interrupted, I need really strong points, not these weak points. Um, <laughs> Sophie Lloyd, from the floor, made a speech for the opposition. No, she didn't. From, from this side of the house, made a speech, a very, very fine speech. I don't think I need to say any more about that, except that I agreed with every word of it. So that brings us on to Roger Alton. Now, Roger Alton, in my opinion, was the best editor of The Observer in the last 30 years. In my belief, my humble belief, Roger Alton is a great man. But great men can be wrong. <laughs> Tonight, Roger, you were wrong. <laughs> what did we learn about Roger Alton, the great Roger Alton, tonight? We learned that he hangs about in Thornton Heath at dusk. <laughs> we, learned, we learned that he's terrorised by mum's net. <laughs> and, most intriguingly of all, we learned that he fancies Alan Yentob. <laughs> He talked about, and I quote his very words this evening, great programmes, great presenters, great ratings. We agree, Roger, we rest our case. I'd like to welcome the second member of the proposition to this side of the house tonight. And in due course, I'll be able to welcome the third, quoting his words at him too. But we shall come to that. Um, Roger asked, where's the new writing? Where's the new comedy? It's on television, Roger. You need to watch television. <laughs> The BBC does hugely more than other organisations in all those categories. Of course the BBC can do better, of course we're not complacent, but it is unfair to say the BBC is failing the nation. John Sopel, another speech for the opposition, one I felt obliged to interrupt twice, which I'd like now to apologise, John. I enjoyed it. You enjoyed it, thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed it too. <laughs> But another speech for the opposition and another spookily brilliant one, I thought. <laughs> so then we came to the floor speech. Christopher Monk, I think his name was, uh, from that monastic college, Trinity Hall. <laughs> um, he said that the BBC had too many services. Well, Christopher, I need hardly point out to you, even if you are from Trinity Hall, I'll speak slowly, but... Um... <laughs> hardly point out to you, if the BBC is providing all these services, such a surface of services, it's hardly letting us down, is it? It's burying us in services. Not, not what I think we call letting us down. Um, Harry, up there, spoke against the motion. Good for you, Harry. You look like a sensible bloke. <laughs> then we had Simon from Robinson College. He had it in for the British media in general. He didn't just like, just like the BBC. He had it in newspapers, radio, he had it everything. I think Simon's the sort of person who prefers Facebook in the company of strangers. <laughs> 
then, then we had Jamie Scott from Jesus College. Now, Jamie said that it was the BBC's fault that newspapers are failing and their sales are plummeting. It's not really the case. The real problem for newspapers is the, is the loss of advertising to Google. That's the biggest problem they face. But uh, just to pick Jamie up on his point, how many people in this hall bought a newspaper this morning? How many bought one this morning? Hands up. Jamie, I think I know why the newspapers are failing. <laughs> and I think it's got F all to do with the BBC and rather a lot to do with your purchasing habits. And by the way, Jamie didn't put his hand up, so there we are. <laughs> Nothing like a bit of healthy hypocrisy. <laughs> There was a lady from Homerton, she spoke for the opposition, very fine college. Um, <laughs> there was Luke from Christ, I don't recall what he said, so never mind. <laughs> and then there was Joseph from Jesus College. Now, Joseph posed a very tough question. And of course, we have to take Joseph's question very seriously, because you know what? Stand up for a moment, will you? <laughs> Stand up. You see, he's a fire officer, so we have to... <laughs> He said, why should the BBC be allowed to, you know, by law, take £142? Now, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. <laughs> it's called, if you like, in effect, taxation. <laughs> it's compulsory. We have a tax. It pays for health. You may not go. You look pretty healthy, Joseph. You may not use the health service, but you pay for it when you pay taxes. You may not use. You may have been privately educated. You may not have been. If you were, you didn't use state education, but in your taxes, you pay for state education. The BBC is in the same category. I will come back to that. But I hope, Joseph, I'm beginning to make sense. <laughs> there was a gentleman in the red suit up there who I thought, with the benefit of wisdom and years, who's lived in many countries around the world, and said he missed the BBC when he wasn't there. I thought that was a very eloquent speech in support of the BBC and a point to be taken most seriously. And then we came, I have one minute remaining according to you, but I might take a little bit more than that. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't think there's any reason why you should look frightened, all right? <laughs> all right? Just, just, just relax and we'll, do, we'll get through this together. <laughs> okay. Um, Tom, the final speech, the man with the unhealthy fetish for footwear. <laughs> His words, I'm going to quote them to you. I love the BBC, I admire the BBC. May we now welcome the third member of the proposition to this side of the house. Tom said, many things. <laughs> Few of them I followed. He is that dangerous phenomenon, the impenetrable intellectual. He used the word conundrum. I thought it was an excellent word to describe his speech. <laughs> His best argument, and he said this with great sonority, it simply is the case. I haven't wrote the word, it simply is the case. It simply is the case. Completely unanswerable. This was existentialist angst of a very high order. He said the BBC is independent, impartial and honest. Well, he said it should be, rather. And I agree with him. That's an aspiration. It's a noble aspiration. Does it always achieve it? No. Does it try to? Yes. Therefore, it does not, I would argue, let us down. He also later on talked about, in his, uh, in his conundrous speech, if there's such an adjective, platonic superlatives. We felt a bit safer at that point when he used the word platonic, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> um, but, his, his argument, but his argument boiled down to, we expect too much of the BBC. It was a subtle I think over subtle argument. I think we could say his argument disappeared up its own A23. <laughs> so, I am now concluding, Madam President, please. I request a small amount of license. Can I ask, please, in the last seven days, who, whether radio, online, video on demand, iPlayer, who's used the BBC in the hall? <laughs> yeah, okay, I think that's. <laughs> That's what we call a visual argument, okay? <laughs> so, I will now conclude. I want to conclude by making one, one point above all, and it's something I referred to earlier. The BBC is a trusted and reliable source of news and information in a wicked world, in a more confusing, weird, strange world, internet world, than ever before. I believe there is no greater expression of a mature democracy that a government will in effect, or people, will pay for a service which is impartial enough to be able to criticize the government that enables its funding. That is in itself 
an incredible plus. Secondly, and as I think I've said twice already, we need the BBC more than ever because in the new world we need trusted and reliable sources of information more than we ever did when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge. And thirdly, it is a noble public aim to have this service, the BBC, and it is as noble as having a national health service or a national education service. And that, Joseph, is why we should uh, oppose this motion tonight. You people in this hall tonight, you are actually, you may not yet know it or you may not want, not yet like it, but you are the leaders of the next generation. I look here and I see the chief executive of a multinational corporation. I look over here, I see the future head of the civil service. I look here, I see a member of the cabinet. I look there, possibly even a director general of the BBC. Admittedly, none of you have learned how to dress for the part yet. <laughs> but I see the leaders of the next generation. The BBC is something that we need to exist many more years than its next charter renewal in 2016. It's utterly noble. Of course it has er er errors and faults. It is not letting us down. And I suggest, not just for this generation, but for future generations, you oppose this motion tonight, you throw it out, you make it clear that you support the principle of the BBC, and you walk through the no door tonight. Thank you very much. Um, just before we end the debate, I just want to tell you a few of the events we've got coming up. Tomorrow night we've got geographer Professor Doreen Massey and humanitarian Dr. Vinishwar Kathak. On Monday night, Esther Ranson, and on Wednesday night, Holocaust Memorial Day. All the events are open, so please do bring along your non-member friends. And um, if you want to buy a membership now, you get two free tickets to a debate worth £40 if you're not already a member. Um, you vote by walking out through the doors, eyes to the right, nose to the left, abstentions down the middle, and can we have one more round of applause to thank our speakers tonight?